in. So it's uh, a bit early in the morning here, so which is why it is dark outside. Um, but it's a, a great pleasure to speak to you. I was uh, in Singapore in February of this year or just to, uh, to speak to the uh, in Corporate Secretary Group in, in Singapore, so that was a real pleasure. Um, so what I'm hoping to do this morning is to give you a picture of what we have seen happening in, in boardrooms over the last six months here in Europe. Um, but also to share with you some thinking about how we see the board developing post-pandemic and how that impacts the role of the company secretary. Um, if we could just move on to the, um, to the next slide, just about us. Um, we. So, I'm sorry, Mr. Richard, you yeah. are not sharing your slide. Oh, you're not showing the slides. So if I share my screen then, is that the, the way we do it? Yes. Okay. Um, so if I go on to share screen. At the bottom panel for Zoom, there is this share screen yeah. function, and then you can yeah. just click on your PowerPoint slide. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I want to talk about is how the board may develop after the pandemic and how that might affect the role of the company secretary. Um, at Independent Audit, we are, see a lot of boards because we are board evaluators. And over the last six months, therefore, we have continued to undertake board evaluations. Uh, so perhaps surprisingly, we were not expecting so many uh, boards to continue with the evaluation process. but we were finding that uh, has continued. And uh, this is, uh, people continue to give evaluation a priority. So we've continued to see a lot how a lot of boards are working. And also recently, I have participated in some working groups with uh, about 20 company secretaries in each. So over the last few weeks, I've heard from about 60 company secretaries of many different types of companies how they are responding to the pandemic. So I will share some of those thoughts with you today. Um, why why are we, I'm in a position to do this? As I said, we do a lot of board evaluations. At Independent Audit, we've been evaluating boards for some 18 years and have seen, it says here 350, but the number is actually now something like 400 different boards over that time. And these are boards of very different uh, organizations, many of them listed, but a lot of them not listed. Um, so there's some are subsidiaries, some are private organizations, family owned organizations, um, or charities or public sector or regulators. So many different types of boards. And so we see how different forms of governance are working. Um, so, of course, the, the board effectiveness equation is changing. Um, and so I will go, what I'm going to do is just talk to you about what sort of changes we are seeing in the boardrooms. Um, funnily enough, um, at the beginning of this year, and we published a, a monthly electronic bulletin, which is called the Effective Board. And this is, uh, if any of you would like to receive copies of that automatically, please just contact us at the address at the end of the presentation. But every month we try to look at what is changing in the way boards need to, how boards need to work effectively. And for the new year, January edition, we talked about how we saw boards working in 2030, thinking that that was a long way ahead 
but then suddenly we found ourselves with our predictions for 2030 suddenly developing, suddenly taking place in 2020. So we were a bit 10 years ahead of our time. But um, so it's been interesting watching all of this, this happen. But um, what I'm going to do is use a bit of a model to explain how we see things working differently in the future and explain what an effective board needs to do in this different working environment. Don't worry too much about the, uh, the detail at the moment. I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, but you can see there's three different aspects to this framework, if you like, that we have developed to help boards think this through. There's the strategic, there's the areas around risk and control, and there's how the board actually works. And I'm going to walk through each of those three sections. So just starting with the strategic, what are we seeing? Of course, I don't need to explain to you how, how the, the scale of the impact, obviously, that the pandemic is having on many different, uh, if all organizations. Um, and of course, that is then felt in the boardroom. So what are we beginning to see? It's still early days, people are still very much focused on responding to the immediate operational and financial challenges. But what we're beginning to see is a recognition that companies are going to have to revisit their vision, their purpose, their values in this different environment. It's affecting how organizations see their social responsibility, how they work with the communities. Clearly, as the fiscal, the tax, the government revenue implications are felt with the economic downturn, there's also going to be questions raised around the board's fiscal responsibility and their tax strategies, which may need rethinking. On the environmental side, early in the, in the early days of the pandemic, we heard a lot of discussion around how this might be affecting uh, the environment, and how that changes the organization's re relationship around the environment. Over, what we've found over the last few months is it's gone quiet. There's not so much discussion around that, but we believe that that will actually come back uh, very firmly to the top of the agenda. Environment, social and governance, ESG, as it's called um, in English, is very much at the top has been at the, at the top of agendas and I think will firmly stay there, partly because when the investor community refocuses, uh, once the pandemic is hopefully a bit more uh, under control, then the investor community is going to, still going to be pushing boards very hard in relation to the ESG agenda. But one thing we're beginning to see very clearly is a lot more board time being set, spent on scenario planning. At the moment, that tends to look like looking at different scenarios for budgeting purposes. Uh, obviously, a lot of companies are coming to the end of their financial year and are now faced with the challenge of how to actually undertake budgeting in an, en in an environment where there's such considerable in uncertainty. But they still need to do this. So what we're finding is boards spending much more time looking at different scenarios, looking at different budget outcomes and thinking through how they are then going to apply that, both in terms of monitoring performance over the next year, but also how that fits in with remuneration, with compensation issues, and what people are being measured against, and how remuneration committees are going to be applying discretion when there's so much uncertainty around the budget. But it's not only around budgeting. Obviously, a lot of companies are having to do now some longer term financial planning and revisit that in the context of what their, their capital needs are going to be as they try to respond to the financial fallout of the pandemic. But not only that, it's also looking, taking a different approach to looking at the big strategic risks. There's a widespread recognition that probably in the past, boards have not spent enough time thinking through what the major risks of their business might be. Um, there's been a tendency for that work to be done at the audit committee or the risk committee level 
and it to be focused on what is going to be included in the annual report and accounts around the principal risks. But obviously that has not helped boards really think through what are the big, big things that could go wrong and really threaten our business, and certainly threaten the success of our business and our share price. So I think there will be a, a revisit of how boards actually approach scenario planning and, and people overcoming this past reluctance to spend time on what they used to see as speculation, but what they now see as probably an essential role of an essential responsibility of the board. And just lastly, I think the, the innovation agenda will just become even greater. I mean, obviously the, it is not only in the way the board works, but how the organization works and with, alongside technological change and how you interact with your customers, how you interact with your suppliers. All of this has been, if you like, thrown up in the air by the, the pandemic. So there'll be a lot of more focus on innovation. In the past, we have found that whilst a lot of companies talk about innovation in their annual reports and in their communications with investors, when you get into the boardroom, there's not actually that much focus on innovation. So I think that is also something that will change. But possibly the biggest change is going to be around stakeholders. I th what we're seeing is organisations recognising that they have a much more, a much closer role to play in relation to really thinking through how they work with their customers, and their suppliers, third parties and the regulators, but crucially also around their people. Again, what we have often found is that what we call the people agenda just does not get enough board time. And, and so thinking through how your workforce is able to respond to uh, the working from home environment, to distancing, uh, the impact on their welfare, the impact on their families, all of these sort of issues are now going to have to be much more central to the way boards think and make the decisions they make. And then, so just tying this strategic development back to uh, the company secretary, obviously this implies a significant change to the board agenda. So agendas are going to have to be rethought. And so company secretaries are going to have to help chairmen and CEOs really think through how the board focus, how the board agenda changes going forward. The chairman can't just think it through this by him or herself. They need some guidance and that comes from an experienced company secretary helping them think that through. So it really puts the, the company secretary in a much more strategic position than um, before. So that's the first section I wanted to talk about. The second section was around um, risk and control. So what we're seeing is audit committees and in, in banks and financial institutions where there's a board risk committee, then beginning to rethink how their agenda uh, covers control in the post <clears throat> or in the pandemic and then post pandemic environment. Of course, the, the parts of the, what we call the assurance framework that uh, audit committees, risk committees used to rely on. Some of those are, are now having to work in a very different way. External audit processes are having to change quite significantly. Internal audit teams can no longer go out into the offices to see how things are working, to do audit walkthroughs with um, management and staff, or to see the evidence firsthand. So they're having to really rethink uh, how that works. So audit and risk committees similarly have got to ask themselves, are we getting the evidence that we really need around audit issues? <clears throat> but also, and perhaps most importantly, the risk management framework is being revisited. 
clearly for most organizations, at least in Europe and North America, maybe in Asia, past experience has put you in a better position. But certainly in Europe and North America, the pandemic risk was not taken seriously. It was not featuring sufficiently on risk registers. It was not being discussed at board level or management level in the, in the way that was needed, but particularly at board level. And so this highlights a weakness in the risk management framework, which has then led to questions as to whether the risk management framework is really making as much a difference in the way to the way the organization works as they would expect. So this, I think during next year, there will be a lot more revisiting of the risk management framework, asking whether it really is achieving what the organization needs it to achieve. But what we're also seeing is audit and risk committees having to revisit the risk landscape, particularly in the context of working from home. This is uh, the way people work from home obviously introduces new levels of risk around security. Um, many companies have already uh, got on top of that risk or actually managing that risk quite effectively. But you have to think very broadly. And again, this is where the company secretary needs to be working with, with the IT department to really think this through. And because it's not only technology risks in terms of the use of VPN, secure use of VPN, secure use of Zoom or Teams, whatever. It's also about confidential information that is in people's homes. How are they storing that information? Where's it kept? How's it destroyed? It's about issues such as if you're sharing accommodation, either with family or anybody, who's actually overhearing or in a position to hear discussions on a Zoom call? How does this affect insider trading lists? All, many different aspects that need to be considered in relation to the security around these virtual meetings. So that all needs thinking through in terms of cyber risks and working from home. But obviously there's many different aspects also affecting the organization in terms of the operational resilience, the financial resilience. You know, how strong are we operationally? How strong are we financially? really, especially if this situation continues uh, throughout 2021. What has it taught us about the resilience of the organization, about our dependencies on third parties, on, on how it has affected our supply chains? And then what are the legal and regulatory risks connected with this? Um, I mean, the regulators so far, at least in the financial services industry, have been so far have been quite patient and have been giving boards a lot of time and space to see how they respond and to the pandemic situation, how they work as a board. But our expectation is that now they will start becoming a lot more demanding. I think there is regulator concern about how board discussions are taking place and how board decisions are being made. They will want reassurance they will want to be a lot more confident that the sort of discussions and decision-making processes that used to be the case pre-virtual meetings are actually still there. And I think boards are going to find, and, and the regulated entities, find themselves under a lot of scrutiny from the regulators about how they are working. And just lastly, obviously the people risk uh, has changed. I mentioned this a bit earlier in relation to the people agenda, but uh, the risks uh, around obviously working in different teams, A, B teams, uh, the risks of not having enough resources uh, if, if a, a company is badly affected, all of these things, but also individuals, how they, their welfare, their mental state, etc. There's many different as aspects to this. So boards in the audit committee, the risk committee, have now got to be, take a much more, more expansive approach to really thinking through the risks. And the third area I wanted to talk about is just um, the way the board is working. Um, I would start out by saying I think most boards, probably all boards actually, have been very positively surprised at how quickly they have been able to respond to working virtually. Um, 
But I think as, as time has moved on and we're now six months into working differently, they're recognizing that actually things do need to change in the way they work. Even though most people have managed to make virtual meetings work, the problem we are seeing is that they're trying to apply the same structures, the same processes as before into a virtual context. So meeting structures that worked in physical meetings, they're still trying to adopt the same approach in a virtual meeting. And you can't do that. It's just such a different environment. So to give you some examples, um, we're finding that boards continue to hold quite long meetings, certainly the same length of meetings that they had before. But we're hearing from individual directors that when you're working on screen in the virtual meetings, you can't do that. The level of concentration required is much greater and people get tired more easily and their participation and engagement becomes less. So meetings need to be shorter or at the very least, they need to have more regular breaks. I was observing an audit committee last week. It went on for three hours without a break, virtual on screen. And you could see after an hour that people were not engaging in the way that they needed to. So the company secretary needs to work with the chair to, work, to think through how much time is realistic, how to break up meetings, how to think about doing things in a bit of a different way to help people participate more effectively. And one other thing they can do is look at the committee schedule. Normally committees are held either the day before or the same day as the board meeting. That's because everybody would be physically in the same place. And so it was convenient for everybody. But now people do not need to have the meetings all back to back next to each other. Generally, non executive directors now have more flexible diaries. So different scheduling opportunities arise. But also they don't need to physically be in the same place. So it gives you the option of holding the committees at a, on a different day. And that just helps break up the structure so that people are not so tired by constantly sitting in front of a screen and trying to participate in a meeting for hours on end. Um, just on time, the other aspect that many people are, are finding difficult is where you've got non-executives in different time zones, um, significantly different time zones. So whether you, when you've got somebody in, in North America trying to participate in a meeting in, in Asia, for example, um, it's, Obviously, there was no easy solution. What, what we were hearing from boards is what they're trying to do is be a bit flexible to so that it's not always the same people who have to get up in the middle of the night to participate in the meeting. Uh, sometimes they'll try and do it early in the morning or late in the evening just to share the, uh, the burden. But obviously, obviously, there's no easy solution to that. But it's something that you have to be very careful about. Um, Anyway, just coming back to my list, in terms of the way time is managed, what we're seeing is boards becoming a lot more disciplined about making sure there's no management presentations uh, or maybe management introduce their paper uh, for two minutes. Uh, but taking the paper as read is now becoming real. Before, people would say, well, we'll take the paper as read and then go on to discuss the paper at length and actually give a presentation. On a virtual meeting, that does not work well. It takes up too much time and people don't want to sit staring at a screen listening to a long management presentation. So management needs to become a lot more disciplined and avoid repeating papers uh, and just have that two minute introduction. And we are seeing that happen quite successfully. Um, Strategy day is a difficult one uh, because obviously one of the benefits people usually get a strategy day is the, the physical interaction, the good discussions as a group. Um, but they are happening. Uh, the, the, what I would recommend though is 
looking at the structure of it. Don't try and have a strategy day where you've got eight hours of discussion. Well, maybe spread it over a few weeks in different sections. Maybe management presentations can be given by video so that people can watch them before you get into the strategy day discussions instead of time being taken up. So there's many different ways, especially through using video, that uh, information can be shared differently. Um, and I'd like to see actually more board papers being done by video. Often I think you look at the, the length of the board packs and the amount of reading that has to be done. And often you think, well, wouldn't it be more effective if each of the managers actually recorded a video and shared their thinking and information by video? It'd be a lot more interesting than just relying on the board packs. And maybe that's one of the things that will start coming out of these pandemic driven changes. So just the last things I want to mention is um, around the way the board works is really thinking through uh, different aspects of the, the way the board thinks. Partly, uh, I think this is around leadership. As we go through a crisis and a continuing crisis, the board needs to think through what role is it playing as leaders of the organization? Is it going to just be seen by the organization as a very distant part, uh, sort of governance, part of the governance process? Or is it actually going to work closely with the executive to really lead the organization through a crisis? Something for boards to think about. And also to think about what the dynamics in the boardroom actually are in terms of what that looks like as, as working as leaders. My second point is a bit more difficult to understand possibly, but comfort with ambiguity. What that means is boards actually recognizing that the world is very uncertain, even much more uncertain even than, than in the past. And so decision-making can't be based on any degree of certainty. And boards like evidence, they like certainty. It helps them make good decisions, but that has changed. So now boards have to get much more used to uncertainty. They also have to be focusing much more on what I describe as the soft, the people agenda, the human aspects of the organization, the values, the culture, things that they have to rely on going forward as people work in different ways. Um, and the other aspects, just I've already mentioned board packs and, and the logistics of making meetings happen. But just a bit of, just to close, just some last reflections on what we're seeing there. Um, I mean, people have found technology working reasonably well and certainly improved over the last two or three months. But one disappointing uh, aspect is that we are still, when we observe meetings, still seeing some people not participating via video, some people encountering technological or broadband challenges which is preventing them as directors participating properly in the meetings. Uh, now, maybe in Asia, you're more uh, on top of these technological issues, but certainly it, what we're seeing in Europe and North America is inadequacies in participation down to technology. And in our view, after six months of this, that is not acceptable. Um, you know, directors have a responsibility to work with the IT functions to actually make sure they have enough broadband width um, they have all the necessary tools they need in order to participate properly in a board meeting, just being excluded from discussion or not participating by video so that the body language, the dynamics are as good as we can get them, in my view, is, is not acceptable. So boards who are still having those difficulties really need to focus on them. Um, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, Technological opportunities exist, of course. I was hearing from uh, the subsidiary of one Amer an American bank how they are very seriously looking at virtual reality board meetings so that uh, people can actually imagine they're in a boardroom and people have their allocated positions at the board table, that sort of thing. Uh, quite how that works in the sense of how you see your colleagues uh, without uh, virtual reality goggles on, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, we'll see how it goes. But it's, it's some op exciting opportunities here. So we'll see how uh, technology drives things. Personally, I think it's more going to be a question of how technology changes the way board information is presented, how board packs and use of videos, that will be the next stage. Um, 
but uh, we'll see. Maybe there'll be some exciting opportunities. But I just want to, to close by pointing out, so that's just a summary of all of those points. Um, you know, I just want to point out that it really is, the, the effective board in future is going to be the one that is now able to think very differently. We can't work in the, with meetings with the same structures, or we can't work very effectively with meetings with the same structures. People do need to think differently, and the agenda is different. People have to have a different approach to the agenda. As we've shown in this, this uh, cartoon, um, the risks, of course, have changed massively. So how can a board just continue to work the same? It can't. It's got to think differently. And the company secretary has got to be at the centre of that different thinking, really helping not only the chair, but also the rest of the board, the committee chairs, the senior executives, think through what working effectively as a board means in this very different environment. So I will uh, stop there. Um, if you'd like to discuss this with us at all at Independent Audit, we've got myself based in Europe, uh, uh, but we've also got my colleague, Philip Baldwin, who is based in Hong Kong. Uh, and obviously we'd be very pleased to have an opportunity to talk to any of you about the issues we've talked about today and about board evaluation and how we can uh, help you look at the, how effectively your board is working not only uh, in the sort of business as usual environment, but in the in the pandemic situation. So thank you very much for your time for listening, and I, I now look forward to joining my fellow panelists for a, a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. So moderating this panel discussion will be Mrs. Grace Tan, Chief Executive of Chartered Secretaries Institute of Singapore. So before we start with the panel discussion, I'd like to make mention that if you have any questions, you can post them to the Vision Hole platform that we have. Is the link is included in the chat box. Right. Thank you, Richard, for the interesting presentation of how board and the agenda will change or is changing uh, in this current environment. And now board has to adapt more faster uh, to more scenario planning. And you highlighted quite a bit on the risk management, risk management part of it. So from the secretary point of view, if your board change the agenda, the secretary will also have to work together with the board on meeting the, the changes to the agenda. So, um, I would like to uh, uh, pose some questions to the panel. Um, and before that, let me introduce them. Uh, we have Miss Catherine Grace. She is the Corporate Secretary from PT Bank Permata, Indonesia. Stella Lowe, she is the Council Member of uh, HKICS and the Vice President of Professional Development in the, in, in the Hong Kong Institute. She's also the Group Company Secretary of GOKO. Uh, we have Nathaniel, the chairman of CSIS. He's very much involved in the uh, listed company, uh, especially the Catalyst company. And we have Oi Hua, uh, she's the corporate service provider, director of Epsilon Advisory Services, Vendoran by Heart Malaysia. And last but not least is actually Pansi. Um, I call her Pansi in short. Um, and she's the president of the Thai Listed Company Association. Um, are we able, to, JY, are we able to see the faces of all our panelists? Are you able to start your video? Okay, we all start our video. There we are, the panel. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, for, for the first question, I would like to ask the panel is this. Um, the, the, how has the role of the corporate secretary or company secretary evolved over the years? We have been through some huge crisis, the GFC, the, AF, um, the global financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis, SARS, and now the long-drawn uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And when we speak to some, when I speak to some of the company secretaries, they told me, Grace, our role has actually changed and uh, significantly it over the time. So maybe I would like to uh, 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 give it to Oiwa, the, the, the chair from the service provider part of point of view, how do you think the role of the corporate secretary evolved over the years? Then I'll come down to the, the, the other panelists. 
All right. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Definitely the role of the company secretary has changed a great deal. Uh, it has moved from just being mere administrators itself to now being compliance officers, uh, being the governance officer. And we play, particularly for a public listed company, a very great role in terms of dealing with uh, other stakeholders, particularly the investors itself. So I will say that um, as company secretaries, we have uh, gone beyond compliance and reg uh, regulations itself. I think it is um, being in tune with uh, the company itself and not just uh, practicing governance uh, for the company secretaries. So uh, as what Richard mentioned, the secretaries play a much bigger role role even in the boardroom itself. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Grace, I think you're muted. Sorry. Okay, let me repeat. Thanks, Oiwa, for the feedback. Uh, very interesting to know that our role has changed so much. And we become, I, I wrote here, we take on multiple roles. We also multitask, mm. you know, yeah. and then we we wear big names, COSAC, CGO, corporate governance officer, yes. and whatever we have. If we are legally trained, they call you general counsel. So it's, it's a lot of responsibility that comes with it as well. So maybe I move to Hong Kong, Stella, uh, from your perspective, uh, you are in-house company secretary. How has that impact or your, the role that you have in there and how it has evolved? Uh, well, as uh, uh, Richard and uh, also uh, Omar has uh, have mentioned, um, our role was uh, uh, is not just limited to you know administrators or compliance officer. Uh, the advisory role uh, has become more and more prominent, and uh, uh, we will need to advise the board how to deal with all the changes in the regulatory and compliance compliance matters, and. Uh, as we are now uh, uh, facing uh, increasing um, governance um, requirements and procedures, uh, I think the board has been relying uh, on us to you know, provide a, a very good advice and solution to them on how to manage the corporate governance in a more efficient way. Uh, I think, uh, and also you mentioned about multitasking and this is, uh, you know, uh, I think increasingly um, uh, uh, prominent uh, on our role. Uh, we will have to know um, uh, more about everything. For example, um, uh, risk management uh, and also uh, um, the uh, technology, how the technology will influence us, uh, the impact on the company, and also the uh, board uh, 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 governance process and all these things as as well as the uh, how the the uh, in technology affect the, the risk of exposure of, of the of the company I think a lot of things uh, we need to board to the board attention and as Richard mentioned about changing the board agenda and also the board committee's agenda uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the board will have oversight uh, on, on these uh, new issues uh, so as to help them to, to fulfill their duties in respect of corporate governments. Thanks, Stella. So let's move to Indonesia. Catherine, you work in a bank. I think it's even more challenging for you uh, for, with all this impact. So maybe you can share with us from your perspective, has your role actually evolved much more? Uh, thank you, uh, Grace. So uh, um, in Indonesia, uh, we are now like just starting changing to the virtual uh, meetings and everything. So, uh, and then it's forced us now quicker because of the pandemic. So for instance, uh, the general meeting of shareholders, usually what we do is the, the, the old, old fashioned ways, which is, you know, attending the meetings. 
Now we will be forced by the regulators that we have to be able to conduct the general meeting of shareholders virtually. So even for the regulators, it's also a, a, turn, a quick turnaround for them to be able to have the system or, uh, uh, in place quickly. So uh, can you imagine that when the pandemic started in, in Indonesia, which is it's March, March and April, it is actually the time for a lot of public companies to hold the general meeting of shareholders. Mm. So it is a very, very um, scary moment because, you know, they still, have, they still wanted to show up, the, the shareholders, but then we still have to conduct the meetings as we are following the COVID protocol uh, 19 procedures. So a lot of debates on the validity of the meetings and everything. Uh, that's one thing why why, why uh, corporate security is uh, taking so much uh, so important role to making sure that uh, the meeting is valid, but also the meeting is also uh, uh, accepted by the meet by the shareholders to come, and still follow the general meeting of shareholders. I think that's one of the uh, key uh, challenges uh, during the pandemic for uh, Indonesian context. Oh, thanks, Katrin Grace, for the interesting uh, uh, feedback from uh, how Indonesia has, I mean, we are all in different stages of the pandemic, but it also impact on us how we change and view it. Maybe where's Pansi? From the, from the, yeah, Pansi, you are from, uh, you represent the, the Thai listed company association. From, from the institute or from the association point of view, how has the association moved along uh, with all this pandemic? Thank you, Grace, and thank you all the speakers and panelists. Uh, I think this is a good timing to share the practice uh, uh, you know, of us going through this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, at the association, you know, as you may know that our member are company that lists on the stock exchange of Thailand. So uh, first of all now, all the courses that we offer or actually we offer to our members now all online especially for the corporate uh, company secretaries. I think it's, uh, uh, we have to give them like up-to-date information, uh, especially the change or amendment of regulations. Uh, now the regulator and also the government have relaxed many regulation to allow private sector to you know, have less burden from the crisis. For example, the accounting standard uh, or the uh, array, uh, 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 the organizing of the AGM. So we have to make sure that you know we keep the cross communication with regulators uh, to provide the information for our members. So less confusing, less conf confusing. Otherwise, you know, uh, sometimes regulator they come up with the new information, but not much communication. So we have to be in the middle, make sure we talk to the regulator. We carry all the message or information to our members. Mm. And, and also now we're talking to our, uh, our members. Many company secretaries, are, uh, they have to convince the board, you know, uh, number of board members now, I think they like the online meeting, but you lose some, you know, face-to-face uh, -face discussion, especially in, you know, this, I think this quarter you have to do the strategic planning. So at some point you really have to convene the board meeting to discuss about the way forward, you know, on the strategic matter of the company. So, uh, you know, just to, to, to conclude my comment for this round is that we want to make sure that our members and also company secretaries up to date on what happening uh, either on the economic side or regulations. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Pansy. Now I look to my chairman, Nat, to share. Well, we, you, you, we, we have been here also for many years, so maybe Nat has some views that he can share how the core site role in Singapore has evolved as well. Uh, I think basically our core site role has evolved, has changed quite drastically from what it used to be. Uh, it is a fast-paced changing environment. 
and the environment is changing so fast, taking into consideration. So legislation and regulations are becoming more frequent and more complex. So the company secretary needs to be well-versed and up-to-date in this information. The company secretary has to be able to organize things faster and more effectively and essential for the company secretary's role to be more uh, to be in a position to be able to contribute to the board discussions. I think the company secretary must be the go-to person for the board to look at so that they can they can really be the ones that would drive the board and the board agendas and the board meetings. Now, being in the COVID situation, a lot of changes have taken place. The whole board dynamics has changed. The risk management is at a very high level. You can yes. see from a lot of issues with the exchanges facing with a lot of listed companies, a lot of them are not, in a, their targets are way below their budgets. So the question is, a lot of the board members are looking at the company secretary, how to structure their agenda to get the best out of what the situation is. So risk management is an area where the company secretary has to have an input. It's part of our corporate, corporate governance and it's becoming a more relevant part of the corporate governance than before. And uh, I believe that we need to upskill ourselves. Our knowledge needs to increase and our boardroom dynamics needs to increase. And then having our meetings online, there's always a problem with the interactive means of communication. When people are communicating one-sidedly, it has to be one side has to listen, the other one has. Because our technology hasn't gone into a situation whereby like at a boardroom, two or three people can speak together. So enabling, uh, enabling board members to be heard, listen to them, and also constructively contribute in the board discussions. So therefore, company secretary also must know what is the economic situation, not only in the country you're operating, but in the regions that the companies are operating in and what sort of difficulties they are facing, what sort of regulatory requirements they may have to meet. Uh, these are situations that board members appreciate when a company secretary is leading that area in discussion. So it's no longer a, a position whereby you hide back and just be quietly in the board meeting and just take the minutes and understand the discussion. It's changing. And I believe this is an opportunity for company secretaries to rise up. And I believe that even with the COVID situation, a lot of companies, to be honest, are delisting from the exchange. So when they delist, they will be private companies, but they will be big private companies, not small private companies. They will be using company secretaries also. And those areas that, uh, you know, because there may be not so much regulatory requirements that are so clear, so, you know, the board is always looking at gray areas, and this is where the company secretary has to be well-versed in this environment. So the yeah. role is changing. Yeah. Technology is also changing. Uh, we must learn to embrace it. We also must learn to enhance it for our benefit to contribute more to the board discussions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ned, uh, for sharing perspective and also maybe from the Institute's perspective. I, I mean... Um, Earlier, Richard said that with all this, the company secretary is put in a very strategic position now going forward. And we also hear that board agenda changes and we also talk about ESG. So with all this, the, the company secretaries, I think it's a very unique position to fulfill an important role in CG in, uh, in, or as also the conscience of the company. So maybe for Richard, uh, maybe you can share is now going forward with the with the evolving role. What skill set does a company secretary need to manage all this relationship and the tension that the board, management, shareholders, stakeholders are going to? So what what do you think going forward we have to embrace the what sort of skill set? Well, I think it's the things that have just been explained in terms of the skill set. Nathaniel said them out actually very effectively, I think, in terms of this mindset, uh, the strategic thinking, the risk management awareness, um, the interaction with stakeholders, really so many different aspects. And really the things that I went through earlier, a company secretary has got to be very sensitive to an understanding of many different aspects the strategic, the risk management, and also the way the board is working, much more so than before. And that is a, is a big 
big ask. And I think my concern is mainly not so much in terms of the capability or the ability of, the, of an experienced company secretary to do that, because you know, an experienced company secretary has been seeing these things in action over many years. It's not new to them. It's just that the role or the, the scope of the role is possibly new. Mm. So I think the biggest challenge is actually not ability, but resource because you're asking the company secretary to play a very different role, invest a lot of time in supporting the chair, the chairs of the committees, thinking mm. through the agenda, really taking a much more strategic approach to how the board works, at the same time as working on the technology side to make meetings work properly, and at the same time, working with individual directors to help mm. make sure that they feel things are going well and they're involved properly and thinking through the sort of the social interaction side of how a board needs to work and all the complications of how to recruit new directors, etc. The list, the list just goes on and on. Yeah. And at the same time, you've got all the business as usual work to do. So I think company secretaries have to sit down with the chair and with the chief executive and say, look, this has changed. We need more resource in the company secretarial function. Otherwise, the board cannot be supported and change in the way that it needs to. Of course, we all know that is actually a difficult conversation <laughs> yes. to have, especially <laughs> in an environment where people are having to cut costs. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but I think it's one where all you can do is make sure that you sit down the chief executive, sit down with the chair, and say, look, we need, to have a, we need to talk about this and try and help them understand how things have changed and uh, them understand the value to the board of the company secretary being able to play that different role and therefore the value to the organisation in supporting stronger performance. So it's an investment that can be justified, but it's, it's going to be a bit of an educational yeah. process. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's just true that... At times like this, you, you want to ask the board to say, let's spend a bit or uh, invest more in resources. That's for the co-site uh, secretary team is a challenge because they have other priorities to look at as well. How do you balance that uh, uh, or justify that uh, investment? Um, JY, do we have questions from the pigeon hole? Yes, we have a few. Could you want to raise it now so that the panel can have a view? Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, maybe I take the one on the second one with two words. They say, it was asked, the role of the company secretary largely depends on the power of the authority and the association can work out with to entrust to company secretaries to carry on. Um, what is the direction? So I'm not sure when you say authority, are you talking about regulatory authority? Association, are you referring to the respective association? Someone want to try this? Any panel member who want to? I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I tried this one. <laughs> okay, uh, I think where, where they are coming from is that uh, uh, like um, the accountants or lawyers, uh, they actually have stat a statutory backup on their professional mm. positions. And uh, they also have a special role, for example, the accountants, uh, they get the special role in you know, signing the audit accounts. Uh, lawyers and um, whatever, they, they, they will have the special role to deal with uh, a lot of other uh, documentation, etc. So uh, for Hong Kong, um, uh, 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 the listing rules required every listed company to have a company secretaries and the qualification of this company secretaries include either you are a, uh, a lawyer um, uh, um, um, who have a register uh, uh, at the um, uh, Hong Kong Law Association's uh, bar or a uh, accountant under the HAICPA and also uh, or, or you are a, a HAICS member. So these are the recognized qualifications to be a company secretary. Um, 
I, I think um, uh, 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 the uh, question pointing to whether we should, uh, um, you know, um, uh, fight for uh, or solicit the government support to uh, 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 to to put uh, you know statutory um, um, uh, uh, responsibilities to a company secretaries, um, so that uh, it will enhance our importance uh, and. Uh, uh, our role will become more prominent and indispensable uh, in uh, uh, in a company. Um, well, in Hong Kong, we also enacted a uh, the uh, TCPS. The, that means a it's it's a uh, uh, a company's uh, ordinance that require all the business service provider to register. Although that uh, uh, actually put in place because of the anti um, money laundering requirements. Mm -hmm. But that definitely has put uh, some weight on the um, uh, prerequisite uh, qualifications on the service provider um, uh, in uh, you know doing a lot of work in the KYC etc. Uh, to monitoring this position, I think uh, it will be worthwhile for us all to look at this uh, in the future directions to see whether we can enhance uh, the company secretary's role or the corporate governance professional's role in some other uh, aspect uh, of, of, of the commercial world. Thanks, Stella. Um, I want you have something to share on this from the Malaysian perspective or, or uh, global as well. Sure, uh, that's true. Even uh, in relation to the Malaysian's perspective, uh, both the regulators and all the uh, secretarial institutions are working together to bring the level of professionalism for company secretaries to a higher level. In the Malaysian Companies Act, uh, we are kind of fortunate in the sense that uh, uh, company secretaries are still mandatory for private company and that company secretary must be qualified. Uh, with the New Companies Act, 2016 Act itself, uh, it is also imposed on uh, before a person can be a company secretary, not only do you have a professional qualification or is licensed by the Companies Commission of Malaysia, we all now have to have a practicing certificate. And together with the practicing certificate, just like the uh, accountant, uh, the auditors and the lawyers itself, we have also at the same time got to collect CPD points, all right, uh, and to upskill ourselves in, on that note. So mm. the regulators themselves sees the role of the company secretary uh, as a very important person itself, mm. as an advisor to the company in terms of compliance, all right, and uh, not just the Companies Commission of Malaysia, Busan Malaysia, uh, at the same time, our uh, Malaysian Stock Exchange, uh, the Securities Commission also see the company secretarial role being a much uh, higher role as before. So I would say in terms of where, as to whether the associations or the institutions itself uh, governing company secretaries or administrators itself, are they working enough with the regulators from the Malaysian side? Definitely yes. Uh, we have had great success in terms of making sure that uh, we do have at least uh, two or three uh, forum uh, together with the regulators itself. So, um, I think the direction uh, from the Malaysian angle is that uh, the regulators will want to increase the level of professionalism and, they, uh, and with the practicing certificate, uh, they want to weed out those uh, kind of back, back end kind of uh, just run of the mill kind of company secretaries and really put in a um, more professional company secretary. Yeah, thanks, Oiwa. Very interesting to note that it's your, your, your private, the ex still have a qualification for private limited 
company. Well, well yes. done. Nat, you want uh, to share from Singapore? Uh, I'd like to share. Yes, Catherine. Uh, yes. Um, whereas the Malaysian has a quite fortunate regulation to back up the uh, role of the corporate secretary. Uh, in Indonesian context, is actually we are less fortunate, uh, meaning that you know the regulations that uh, empower uh, corporate secretary was enacted um, back to uh, 2014. Uh, so uh, it is quite a old um, regulation. Um, so we need to actually to um, uh, to put more in context of the role of the corporate secretary for the uh, modern society right now. So uh, when we are asked to be able to be the trusted advisor to be the governance uh, gate uh, keeper in the bank or in other uh, companies, then we should actually have a more uh, powerful uh, uh, authority uh, within the organization, which is uh, un uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not the case for a lot of the Indonesian companies. One of the reasons is that the uh, role of the corporate secretary uh, is not as certified as the other professions, like accountant or uh, other professions, uh, the qualifications becoming the corporate secretary is not uh, highly regulated. We just have to be able to understand the capital market and everything. There is no uh, certification issue. Where although our uh, association, which is Indonesian Company uh, Corporate Secretary Association, is now trying hard uh, to get the uh, the recognition from the capital market uh, authority uh, OJK. Or uh, to uh, to accept the uh, the uh, process that the corporate secretary has to be uh, certified, and also of course there are uh, quite level of the uh, process to get the certification, like the the courses and everything that has to be uh, put in place. But uh, we believe that our journey is already begun, and then maybe we are still uh, pursuing that to have the certification for the corporate secretary. But I think for the context of the uh, modern society or the pandemic, then the role of the corporate secretary in Indonesia is becoming crucial. So uh, that is the, um, the, uh, the, the notes from Indonesia. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing the, uh, the position of the company secretary in Indonesia. Hopefully, we, this journey you have, which you have started will become the fruition to have it recognize the role of the company in your OJK. Thank you. Uh, Nat, you want to share on this topic on uh, in terms of uh, the directions? Yeah, sure. Um, currently on our uh, regulation and legislation, the for listed companies, you have to have a qualified company secretary uh, with a professional qualification. That's one of the requirements. Um, unfortunately, in the private limited companies, they have not included it. But I think that going forward, they may have to rethink the idea. It's more the regulator's way of thinking that needs to change. Uh, because we see a lot of companies being delisted, being and they will become bigger and larger private companies. And we also see uh, charities commission and charities requiring company secretaries in various charities. So we see governance as well in that area. But let's uh, just take a few steps back. Um, in, in the Institute, from the Institute's point of view, for the last two or three years, we have been driving the digital transformation map for the company secretaries industry. We've been pushing this arm without realizing that why we would suddenly need it in the time of COVID. It was never our thinking that we would, but when COVID came and when the government put in the regulations to say, you have to work from home and you can't go into your office. I think many of our, our corporate secretary service providers, although they were caught by it, were prepared because they have many times been, been, we've been driving this process of digital transformation. We've been, we've been driving this issue about getting partners within the various, uh, various institutes in Singapore to help in this digital transformation, help in simplifying regulations and regulatory ways of doing it by way of digital means, helping for the electronic signatures to be implemented. 
Um, so we have been moving the industry in this way, but many didn't realize that this would have to come in, in such a short space of time when the COVID, once COVID doesn't allow you to go to your office, there's no way because your data and information are mostly in your office. And if you don't have your systems up and your backup systems up and you're able to save it on your online this and everything, uh, people would be out of touch. And then your companies themselves, your listed companies, your private companies wanting their information uh, suddenly there is an issue. But fortunately for us, because the Institute has taken this drive to digitalize the roadmap for our industry, uh, many of us were already picking it up and were already, a lot of the new companies that were formed, a lot of them were already embracing this new technology. And then when also when the, when the situation arise, when the exchange consulted us also because of the virtual meetings, annual general meeting they were asking us you know what do you do about the notice and what do you need to put into the notice and also what about the proxy form and what about the online voting and how does the online voting the exchange also consulted us on this matter because they really didn't have any clue as to how this process will work out mm. and this is all of a sudden they were forced into it and they were kind of actually leaving it open without commenting until we we took it up with exchange and said, look, you need to give some direction. They say how to give the direction. We are not too area aware of this uh, of the direction to be given. And then, you know, like how to allow the voting to be done online by allowing people to enter into the proxy form, allowing the chairman to cast the vote in. It was something new, never been done before in maybe history. It's first time round and new for all of us. I think also in the exchanges in Malaysia and also Hong Kong as well, I'm sure they all experienced it. Uh, this is suddenly new, having, digital, uh, having meetings by virtue, something new. So we had to work with a few vendors directly as the institute. We got involved with a few vendors directly about their online meetings. But they were asking us what are the ways to set it up, how is the agenda to flow, how is the notice to go in? How is the meeting to be conducted? I think we took a very positive step. And we actually were heading this. We were working with about board portals for some time with certain vendors. But we can't, as an institute, we can't, be, we can't outwardly support a vendor in this matter. We have to be open and, and professional in our way of undertaking. But that helped us because by having these vendors at uh, in communication with us, we were able to say, also even to recommend to some of our clients to you know consider doing it this way, mm -hmm. and that was a big change. So I think, although we have worked with limited circumstances, limited resources, we have had to use our resources wisely, and also use uh, a lot of our company secretaries are very experienced. So. Knowledge is something they have, but using it in a skill set in a way of COVID-19 was completely different. Mm. But they have the knowledge. It's just how to use it. And also, uh, they have to increase their knowledge in a frequency because when you are virtually online, you are talking at a very different way. You're collecting your thoughts at a very different level. And you must be able to be able to... Uh, you know, be able to paraphrase it and be able to speak correctly because you're discussing with the board at the same time you're discussing with your stakeholders. And now if you notice in, in corporate government, stakeholders has a very big impact. It's not like before I can ignore the shareholders, I can ignore this and that. I can't. As a company secretary, you can't because the board can't do that either. Stakeholders, if you look at sustainable reporting, it's been creeping up over the years. Sustainable reporting is becoming more and more relevant, uh, especially now. And sustainable incorporating reporting incorporates your corporate governance, incorporates your annual report. It incorporates the direction of where the company is doing and how do you convey that to the shareholders and make them understand where the direction is going, what the business of the company is, where does the company see itself going in five years, three, five, ten years down the line. And so I say in our role, we've been trying to help. We have two different functional areas. We have company secretaries forum for the listed companies. We also have a local forum for the private companies. But we've been trying our best using as well the online system for AML. And because all companies, when they set up business, the first part of call is the company secretary. 
we have been telling the regulators this for a long time. It is the company secretaries who incorporate the company. It's the company secretaries that have to do the AML and have to do the checks. And because of COVID situation happening, a lot of them were having problems doing the AML checks because the system is online and you're in your, you're at home and the data and information has to be done at a faster pace. And then of course we had to tell the regulators, look, some of the documents can't be filed on time. You know, you've got, because your clients are experiencing problems. They are in different locations in the world. They have also not used to communicating by emails and by, uh, by, by Zoom meetings and everything. So that all changed. So I think uh, the Institute is doing its role. It's also, also having to change its way of thinking as well as the Institute, but we are arriving there. And, but I think the digital transformation map was a very big difference in how we were moving the, the company secretary profession in Singapore. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Interesting. I mean, um, Singapore is promoting that all companies should be, we are a smart nation. So the way to go forward is to digitalize and transform. And actually, it also, it also boils down to if the tone is at the top, then it has followed through to upskill the staff with new uh, skill set. I mean, in terms of technology, in terms of mindset changes, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier. So um, I hope that answers the, the question. Maybe now we're talking, let me pull it back a bit to say that, okay, um, the pandemic actually moved all of us to use solution, digital solution. We, were, we mentioned about holding uh, AGM via, via virtual means, okay? Or even now, uh, I mean, very much, come, very much now in the limelight maybe is the bot portal uh, uh, management system and also Zoom, we can use like Zoom or Microsoft Team or WebEx, that sort of thing. So if we go on this and embrace uh, technology, which is good uh, resources for us, so do you think that the task of the company secretary are susceptible to automation or the task also be automated? That is the question when AI come on board. Oh, they replace us all the job. Everybody will lose the job. I mean, in all industry, not just the course, uh, corporate secretary industry. So from the, the I mean, I like to tap on the, 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 the experience of our panel here. What do you personally think? Will we be replaced? Will this be a robot sitting in the boardroom, taking minutes, answering questions, being questioned by directors, or uh, maybe we, much more better than us because every all the act and all the code we just input into the system and it does uh, uh, mouth it. Okay, so um, Catherine, what do you think about this? Yeah. Um... The, uh, with the new regulation where we can do the electronic genome meeting of shareholders, uh, but with quite a specific uh, regulated uh, requirement to conduct that. And uh, apart from a bank, uh, which maybe most of banks, because of the regulation, have the backup systems and everything, but most of the public companies actually are lack of this uh, 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 IT. Um, uh, capabilities. So then, uh, you know, for the corporate secretary uh, in, in non-bank, we will have problems with this, you know. Uh, so then uh, they need to be back up with the uh, support from the, the board that they are uh, able to, uh, to, uh, to empower the system or uh, actually they can engage the uh, other third-party company who actually provide this IT. But, uh, you know, the regulation still asks that the company has to be an Indonesian uh, entity. Uh, but, you know, there's a loophole for, you know, all the um, uh, IT providers in, in, in outside of Indonesia to enter the big market uh, for the public listed company to conduct all everything in digital. So, uh, you know, uh, corporate secretary uh, doesn't have that kind of uh, capabilities actually uh, to be automated uh, safely with the technology. They are they also have to be equipped with the uh, with the uh, uh, 
knowledge of using all these technologies. So uh, in Indonesia, uh, more challenging that because a lot of platforms are being used and then cover circuit has to be able to, uh, to, uh, to work on all these platforms. For instance, you know, OJK likes to use WebEx, you know, uh, maybe BOD likes to use Zooms and our BOC likes to use Teams. So we have to be able to operate all these platforms, you see. So uh, it's, 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 this uh, technology is new for everybody, including corporate secretary in Indonesia. So they, be, they have to be the one who actually to be prioritized to know these all uh, 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 platforms because, you know, they are the one who's going to set up the, the hosting for all the missing with the, with the technology. And so that's why uh, we need uh, to uh, empower the corporate secretary uh, to be able to really, on top of this, all uh, technology and platforms, and also uh, the message, uh, the other message that I would like to say that also uh, Indonesia is a big market for the IT companies who like to set up Indonesia because uh, for the public companies to conduct the general meeting of shareholders, they have to be able to uh, follow quite restricted re uh, requirements under the regulation, which most of the companies don't have it. So that's why um, that's the, uh, the message. Okay. Richard, so you think the task uh, will be taken over by, uh, by being automated? The task of the company secretary going through with all the board, the gender changes, what is to come? My comments will be, be limited to how the board works. I uh, appreciate a company secretary, a role is much broader than that. But if I look at it from my usual perspective of where the board works, I would say no, it, it, it cannot be because a board that works well is all about people working together well. Mm. And at the moment we're trying to obviously <laughs> keep those sort of interactions, personal interactions mm. going uh, virtually. Um, in the future, I think it will be a mix. I think you will have a mixture of some physical meetings and some virtual meetings. So boards will meet physically less often, but um, the personal interaction, the engagement with each other, the debates, the discussion is vital to governance and vital to board, boards working effectively. And the company secretary has a very important role in promoting that and guiding that and providing the forum, the context for that sort of interaction to happen. And you can't do that in an automated way. And I think there are certain parts of the, the company secretary support for the board, which may become more automated. I referred briefly to board papers and videos, and I noticed there's another question around video papers. So that's yeah. an area uh, that we could perhaps talk about further. But I, I think the actual board meeting, the concept of a board working together is still critically dependent on people. And that means the company secretary being a person and not a, a, not a process <laughs> or a piece of technology. Okay, yeah, interesting. Well, I, I, I do take note of time so um, there are still come questions. Maybe one of the question was this that is posed under Q and A here. Um, okay, maybe this this thing what we say. Uh, what kind of extra resources does the panelist think will be useful and beneficial to assist the board to cope with COVID challenges? Um, maybe Stella, you you want to attempt. Uh, to share with us what's in Hong Kong? Um, as you all know, the, we are restricted in traveling. So uh, we mentioned a lot earlier that a lot of meetings uh, have uh, been held by Zoom. Mm. And uh, uh, apart from uh, meetings, uh, I think we, uh, we know that a lot of internal uh, board decisions has to be done by uh, circulated resolutions. Uh, I think it has been a challenge for a lot of us to collect uh, you know, signature from yeah. our directors, etc. cetera. Um, well, I, I think uh, in this respect, uh, uh, a number of uh, you know, technology actually can help us to uh, impute in, in a uh, internal a electronic approval system within the board to help us to collect the approval from our directors. Uh, well, 
um, uh, uh, well, whether we, we can just use the email to collect the uh, uh, approval from, from the directors instead, uh, instead of a so-called the uh, specific apps to do it. Um, I think it involves uh, quite a number of uh, issues that we need to consider. Uh, well, the first of all is the security, uh, the cybersecurity, because when we circulate the information to uh, directors, it would involve uh, uh, confidential information about unpublished information before uh, uh, we uh, uh, release to the market after the board's consideration and approval. And uh, whether our email system is uh, secure, uh, sufficiently secure to um, uh, make sure there is no uh, hacking or no uh, um, possible leak of information. But if we are using a apps uh, that confine the circulations to an enclosed environment, that will increase the sort of securities. But uh, having said that, uh, we will have to look at our constitution, the company's constitution, whether it allows, you know, uh, collections of uh, electronic signature or electronic consent from the directors in order to uh, uh, make a uh, resolutions to take into effect. Um, uh, I know that in Singapore, the law has been, uh, you know, uh, amended to allow to collections of uh, uh, consent from the board um, to uh, uh, and to our, our my companies in Singapore has actually adopted a electronic mm. applications to allow you know collections of consent from directors and when uh, the directors press the approval buttons within this app and the date and time of consent has been recorded and what we need to do is to, you know, attach this, uh, you know, consent form from the system to the resolutions, uh, and then we can consider the resolutions, uh, you know, valid. Uh, but of course, that I mentioned before, it all, uh, you know, boils down to whether your law and also the uh, constitution of the company allows you to do that um, for. My Hong Kong companies or the companies in Bermuda um, where, or Cayman Islands where a lot of listed vehicles has been registered, um, this may not be possible. Uh, so I, I think it will need you to look at your, uh, the law uh, in, the, in the respective jurisdictions and your particular constitution. Mm -hmm. And you may want to, if the law itself allow, then you may have to, uh, amend your own constitution, your article or bylaw in order to facilitate uh, this kind of arrangement. Thanks, Stella. I think Singapore, we have a guidance from our accounting and corporate regulatory authority on the use of electronic uh, signature. Uh, Matt, you mentioned that earlier. Would you just want to uh, share on this? Yeah, I think um, I think you not only the um, uh, the accounting regulatory authority have done it. I think the exchange as well has allowed that. Okay. Uh, they've made certain abilities for the time of COVID because our constitution, many of them don't, the constitution does not permit it. But for the situations, circumstances that was operating, there were certain allowances given, mm -hmm. but it's whether it is only going to be temporary or whether it will be subject to companies having to at a later date change their constitution to allow for electronic signatures, to allow for electronic copies to be to be recorded. Um, the, 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 de the question I think is what extra resources that you need? I think technology is one thing. Knowledge is definitely a must and understanding of what the companies are experiencing and uh, how is the board to move and get things done faster, quicker and more effectively? to help the clients yeah. and uh, you know I think that's important it basically the board wants to know uh, what can you do how can it be done and how can it be done faster and effectively uh, your resources that you need is uh, you need a good backup system you need a good amount, good people beside you people that you can trust and rely on and um, uh, you need to work with your organization. You need to work within your corporate, if you're a corporate sector firm, you need to really look at your staff and uh, 
enhance their abilities and their skills and so that they can help you um, smoothen this time and this period, make it effective, e efficient for you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. What about in Malaysia? Do you use electronic signature or digital signature? Uh, I want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in Malaysia, the Malaysian Companies Act has been amended uh, to allow company to use uh, electronic signatures. But this is still very new to the Malaysian mm. entity. And also because uh, in terms of uh, the cases going to courts, the, the judges and the prosecutors and the defense have still still want to refer to uh, web ink copy itself, right? Rather than digitally signed documents and all. So there's a, a lot more hesitancy in Malaysia in terms of using uh, electronic signatures itself. Mm. And I, I must say in terms of resources, uh, I, I think COVID was one of those black swan that none of us actually uh, thought about it, you know, taken from what we just say, you know, it, it's the risk part of it. Mm. So uh, I think the extra resources that um, we, we, I can suggest here is in relation to company secretaries prompting the board of directors to rethink in terms of their risk management. Uh, what is their business continuity plan if a second wave come? And what if the, there is a whole world lockdown, you know, uh, can things still continue to move? What is the technology that is available? Uh, one of the good things in Malaysia is, of course, um, the government actually gives incentive now for companies uh, who have staff who work from home and you need to provide uh, computers or internet line and all those things. So they are giving a lot more incentive for this. So we see every angle, both from the government side, uh, the commercial side, um, and the directors working very much together to cope with this kind of COVID cha challenges. But it's, again, rethinking on the business continuity. And from as a company secretary, you like myself, I'm an external company secretary, but it is prompting the board of directors to rethink again about risk management. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. I know we have reached two o'clock. Um, I mean, it's also lunchtime, but people have missed but to join us. I, I, I want to thank all the participants that stay on. We have 343 as of now. And also oh. thank the panel for missing the lunch, but we think we have an enjoyable discussion. Thank you very much. And much appreciate Richard which is now whatever time eight o'clock in the eight o'clock in the morning is nine. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, his windows getting brighter. Yeah, yeah. 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 the sun has changed. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Yeah. But don't thank, you. Will, thank you. We will uh, put the video recording up and send to the respective uh, member country. Do look out for our next uh, uh, webinar. Uh, hope well, I have no idea what is the topic yet, but it's one coming up in about two months' time, uh, subject to the, pres the president of ACSN's availability. Thank you, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you all. Safe, everyone. Uh, uh, take care. Any announcement? Mm. Lock out, Thank uh, there's no need for logout, but we appreciate yeah. if you could help us to fill out the feedback form. The link will be sent out to you after the webinar. Okay. okay. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Yeah.